And it gives me huge pleasure to welcome back Alan Holmes. Um, I've heard a few of Alan's talks uh, and I always find them very, very inspirational and thought provoking. I'm really looking forward to his talk this afternoon. So please put your hands together. A warm welcome for Alan. Well, this is sort of a show and tell, uh, mostly about the uh, Polo plenum or a quantum plenum, however you like to look at it, uh, a Takashi plenum, I can probably do the word. Uh, I'm going to uh, talk about the idea that the Akashi plenum is uh, dynamic. Is there are levels to it or ranges in it that are dynamic. Uh, actually, I myself am an uh, animist. I believe in life uh, at all levels, everywhere in the universe, and uh, we tend to, especially if we wax towards uh, quantum physics, which is very interesting, but we tend to think of uh, the cosmos as a kind of empty space, and in sort of a way it is, but my idea is that there's a lot going on in it, uh, dynamically. At least we'll talk about that. Uh, you can tap into those different levels depending upon what kind of consciousness you're experiencing. If you're a, a high mystic uh, like Monster Eckhart, for example, uh, you may experience the emptiness of the cosmos. Uh, but on the other hand, if you have a mind towards mythology, uh, magical thinking, mythic, uh, mythic mind, you may find a very dynamic world out there as well. Uh, so I'm going to start a little bit, as I said, it's going to be sort of show and tell. Uh, I'm going to just sort of range around the topics a little bit. We'll start with the piece of guy that everybody seems to start with. Uh, there he is, beginning of uh, the modern idea of the universe as a uh, plot, clockwork universe. Very popular idea for the last two or three hundred years. It's done pretty well for us. It's got us to the moon, got us to Mars, got us to Jupiter, and now there's a new planet totally discovered. Although there's probably some corrections for quantum factor, or for relativity and all that. But anyway, this was the universe, according to the pre-Newton and then uh, post-Newton idea. It was, uh, you could actually build it like that. Uh, I'm not sure if this is a wonderful plot in Prague, but there are two or three, two or three of these around the world uh, that show various aspects of the uh, time of the cosmos and movement of the spheres. There it is, various pieces of mechanical universe uh, blown up as it were. Uh, so, moving right on, I want to emphasize the idea that in reality, while uh, this uh, approximation of the cosmos is a machine, uh, works pretty well for sending spaceships out around the Earth and to the moon and so on. When we look closer, uh, things get uh, a little softer less well-defined, a little more uh, flowery, a little more creative. If we stand back, we see the cosmos is just really big. I mean, it's big. If you've ever read that, it's a uh, hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy. Who knew the size is this big? It's really big. You wouldn't believe how big it is. It's so big that it'll blow your mind. Uh, so there it is. This is uh, zillions of years across vast space and so on. Uh, Give you some idea of how big you can here you are. <laughs> so, we live in a cosmos that's really, really, really big, and every time you think you get an idea of it, they make it bigger. It's very unsettling, as a matter of fact. It's anxiety producing the living cosmos. Can you your finger on And now, bad enough, uh, it turns out that there may be some indefinite number of universes. So, here's this uh, uh, thinking reptile. If multiple universe theory is correct and all possibilities exist, is there a universe in which other universes don't exist? Well, there you have it. Paradoxical. Uh, I want to emphasize the process nature of reality, you know, the cosmos. Uh, everything is in motion, everything is evolving. Uh, we, although we look at it over a short period of time, things seem to be stable. 
uh, as uh, David Brown pointed out, many others, we live in a process uh, universe. And, uh, so let's keep that in mind as a human being. Uh, this is a famous picture of the man by uh, Leonardo da Vinci. We've had a few artists make a feminine version of that as well. We probably should have both of them, but there it is. And uh, one of the things we've discovered during our meetings here, and I think we all knew about before, was that there's more to, uh, to the man than meets the eye. And is there are uh, subtle energies that swirl about, uh, flow through the human organism, both as a living body and then as we've seen, even in post-mortem state, there seems to be a kind of energy vortex uh, that takes different forms. Uh, over time. So, this picture emphasizes the brain, but I just put it up there to emphasize the fact that a more complete image of a human being includes a lot of energy as well, a lot of patterns uh, that run through what we call the subtle realms, or perhaps the quantum realms. I'm not sure what they are, but they seem to have some reality. People describe them, and uh, we've seen uh, post-death, uh, near-death experiences, and of course they've been described in detail in sacred literature since it's the Tibetan Book of the Dead. Uh, so here we see uh, these subtle energies of connected to the brain uh, flowing. Here's a more spiritual image. Hello. <laughs> One of my favorite people in the world. Show up. Uh, this is a, a person meditating. We see the energy field falling out. Uh, in many ways, to see this has been recently uh, represented in many artist renditions. Oh, yes, and this fall on TV, at least in the U.S., we're going to get a, a, a dramatic version of one of my favorite old comic books, Doctor Strange. I don't know how many, hold up your hand if you know that Doctor Strange. Oh, well, a couple of people, yes. He was a comic book character uh, years ago. When he, he inhabits the subtle realms and battles for good and evil. This is a, a Cumberbatch plays Doctor Strange. How bad could it be? And here he is battling some evil force in the uh, in the, the netherworld somewhere. Uh, so, as a civilization, as a group here, we're getting uh, more comfortable with and more aware of the extended subtle energies and fields and patterns that go with our nature of human beings. Uh, people have been working with this for years through what uh, is called healing touch. Uh, in the United States, uh, physicians uh, don't recognize it very well, but in many countries, Canada, for example, there are people in the hospitals that perform healing touch and work with the patients. Uh, and they do so in a very systematic way. I really learned to respect healing touch uh, when I had a dissertation student doing dissertation on healing of touch, uh, working from uh, Oral Bindo's philosophy, actually. But she had practiced in Canada, and we had several other people on the committee on the conference call uh, that we were on defending her dissertation. They started talking about patients. And they talked about patients and working with patients, particular patients, and talking about the way a group of surgeons would talk. And, well, you were on that side, and I was balancing the blood pressure, and I was watching the you know, the uh, respiration. So, uh, these people were all working with subtle energies, but clearly they were organized and dealing with different aspects of the patient. I, I was just, I was impressed. And I can understand how uh, healing touch and subtle healing can, in fact, be an important part of any medical uh, process. So, I have a few pictures just to represent it. I think the interesting thing is that subtle healers. Uh, often don't even touch it. And uh, they, they can have effects. And it, uh, I was always skeptical of this until I met someone who was, uh, would do this sort of thing. Uh, he, he was working with my wife, and uh, I'm not going into a lot of detail. He would pull her up like this without touching her. She was uh, on a table with her eyes closed, and she would come up like that whenever he would move. And then when we went back to the hotel room, she had these bruises on it. <laughs> Uh, and, and had some dramatic uh, medical uh, effects that were very positive as a result of it. So it, 
not a believer in subtle energies and subtle energy healing, I don't necessarily believe that everybody that talks about it does it has great power, but I now believe and know that there are people who do uh, and who can work with these energies and make them uh, very real. So that's part of our extended cosmos, it's part of our extended universe. Clearly, as we move in and out of the physical body, in depth and in sleep, and maybe even in meditation, we carry these energies that's with us to some degree, maybe to a great degree. Uh, so, so much for the extended human being and subtle energies. I'm going to shift gears again. As I said, this is sort of a ramble. We'll go to the next chapter. The next chapter is about the deep mind, and the deep complex aspect of human nature which will connect with this as we go along. And we all know who this uh, character is. For our own, he was one of the people who really first recognized uh, the depth of the human being. And one of the reasons I bring him up is uh, that he recognized certain patterns in nature that were common all over the place. He called them archetypes, uh, and he identified quite a few of them. Uh, these clearly play out through the subtle realms as well as through the physical realms. And uh, perhaps the most common one is the spiral. In fact, you can see it all over the place. Seashell, uh, shape of the galaxies, many galaxies. Uh, these are ab abstract patterns. And they represent this kind of uh, butterfly, I would say butterfly, more of a flower shape, uh, what's often called a mandala. Uh, in which there are spirals within spirals and circles within circles. So, and these can become more and more complex. This is a complex, chaotic pattern that has the swirling uh, spiral patterns in it. This all comes down to Earth oftentimes in what we call synchronicity. And uh, synchronicity, as you all know, is a, is a kind of uh, a miraculous coincidence that we all experience from time to time. It seems to uh, be the cosmos talking to us. All of a sudden, something meaningful happens. Uh, the Egyptians uh, represented this by the uh, scarab beetle. This is a student I drew this uh, painting of scarab beetle. I like it so well, I'm at my desktop. Uh, scarab beetle uh, represents transformation. And I think most of you know the famous story of the lady uh, that was in therapy with Carl Jung. She'd already burned through several therapists and got nowhere, or at least used them up. Uh, and according to Jung, her big problem was she was so rational. It was rational, rational. And she was having dreams about a bug that looked something like this. And one day she was telling Jung the story of the dream. This bug arrived on the window sill, sort of tapping the window, top, 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 top. And she opened the window, and here it flew right in. Uh, it, it frightened her so much and startled her so much that she began to make progress in therapy. Sort of shook her out of her uh, Newtonian world, as it were. These are Egyptian representations of the scarab being we see it, uh, see it in, in the helmets and crown. But it remembers its transformation in kind of a spiritual way. Uh, this one, I mentioned because uh, Joseph Campbell tells a story about writing about an African culture, an African tribe, for whom the praying mantis was a sacred, uh, sacred insect, representing transformation, much like the uh, uh, scarab people did for the Egyptians. And, and uh, Joseph Campbell at the time was living several floors up in a flat in New York City, and this huge praying mantis flopped onto his windowsill while he was writing, and maybe even come in on his desk. Wonderful example of a synchronicity. Uh, synchronicity represents a kind of alignment of inner and outer processes. So you can think of energy, or you can think of information, but there has to be a kind of alignment just because something you know, fortuitous happens. It doesn't necessarily mean it's a synchronicity. Uh, it has to be something on the inside, something on the outside, like the lady who was dreaming about the scarab people, or Joseph Campbell, who was writing an essay about. Uh, the praying mantis image in this uh, African uh, culture, uh, or Carl Jung, we got fish here, I got a picture of fish in a minute, but he was 
busy writing an essay about fish at his uh, retreat uh, and uh, on the lake. And uh, while he was doing so, several people uh, mentioned fish. Somebody sent a picture of the fish. He found a fish, a dead fish on the shore. All these fish appeared at once. A fish, of course, is a symbol of the spirit. It lives in water, which is the spirit. There's also another symbol for the unconscious. So all these things come together and line up. So you get a whole day's worth of fish, for example. Very rich day for the unconscious, rich day for the spirit. Here he is with, uh, with his friend, uh, the great physicist. For some reason, I'm blocking on his name. Polly. Polly? Polly. Wolfgang Polly. Uh, Paul, thank you. Polly was one of the great uh, early quantum physicists and uh, developed what's called the Polly Principle. We could talk more about that. But uh, one of the interesting things about this was uh, early on developed friendships with a number of quantum physicists, early quantum physicists, in fact, uh, because his image, I think in part, I should say because, but along with this, Carl Jung's image of the psyche, the deep inner life, was modeled in part or aligned with the image of the, uh, the atom with the inner nucleus as a source of energy, a source of balance, and uh, the electrons sort of going around. And electrons are sort of like archetypes, you know. Uh, you know where they are when you see them. <laughs> it's a probability cloud model. You, you can't predict where they're going to be, but when they show up, there they are. You know, it's just a collapse of the wave function. It's an archetype sort of like that. You'll know you have an archetype when it collapses on your doorstep. Uh, I mean, you have a dream in which you're visited by uh, a god or a goddess, or as Carl Newman's wife used to say, before she and a lot of women would have an animus attack, um, they would dream of evil men coming after them. My, my first wife did this. She would dream of groups of evil men coming. A very scary dream. It's a sort of an archetypal image of the dark uh, uh, male uh, archetype. In, in that sense, the archetype of the uh, shadow. Uh, and for some reason, the women was fragmented, at least in those days. I don't know whether it is today or not. Uh, I had dark dreams too, usually, that some evil witch would show up, and she was all one piece and scared the daylights out of me. Uh, dark feminine. So, uh, Polly and Jung were very interested in synchronicities. Polly had more coincidences than you can shake a stick at. Constantly, constantly running into words and uh, places and names and numbers that would all just line up in an uncanny, just kind of strange way. And so they became two different ones. Another, uh, everything is connected. Well, you can't really study synchronicity very long and not think that things are connected. Have to be connected through some kind of a cosmos that is uh, beyond Newton's uh, cosmos. Separate parts uh, bumping together. I think it's subtle connections of some kind. So we've talked about subtle healing, energy healing. We've talked about the idea that we're connected. I don't know how much we've talked about that. We've talked more about that, but uh, I mentioned this the other day. Uh, my colleague, Christian De Quincey, who is really a superb consciousness scholar, uh, has written a whole book uh, about the idea that at the deepest subjective level, we should be really flow together. This is not a mysterious, uh, mystical thing. You can, you can sense it. You can sense your connection to other people, especially people you know. Uh, so I think, I think he's right. I think we're all connected. And uh, we're connected more than we realize, really. Uh, those of you who open yourself to this dimension and experience in relationship, I think we'll be able to verify that relationship is something that uh, emerges from within and has a depth and power, uh, especially in particular times and places. So, in this sense, uh, the cosmos is very much of a piece that is very much connected. And we as individuals are very much connected. People have done a lot of studies of, well, they've done a few. <laughs> uh, they've done a few studies as well. Mm -hmm. Stephen can certainly talk more about this than I can, maybe he will. 
Uh, but uh, uh, there's been a lot of, I think, reasonable research to show that ESP kinds of things are going on all the time. Between us, you just have to pay attention to them or recognize them as such. So I'm going to agree with that, and I'm going to say it goes even further than that. Uh, if you really experience and hold yourself experience other people. Uh, for example, in meditation, I had a very uh, palpable uh, experience of traveling with my grandmother when she died. As a matter of fact, uh, I, she was hundreds of miles away, but I, had a, I was meditating, and I had a sense of being with her, and I had a sense of traveling. Uh, was what the Greeks called a psychopomp. Hermes was a psychopomp who traveled with the soul into the netherworld down in the, you know, um, That was part of Hermes' job. And I was playing the role of Hermes there. It's not something I normally do. I was very close to my grandmother emotionally. But I don't want to say I was involved with her. <laughs> or there was anything like that. It was just a loving relationship. And it just seemed very real to me. And I later discovered that she had died actually at that time I had a sense of traveling with her. I only mention this because I think we're all connected in, in that way very deeply. And of course we've already heard uh, somebody mentioned uh, Jeannie Ackerberg's uh, work. Who mentioned that? Jeannie Ackerberg, a uh, very bright lady, worked at Seabrook. Somebody gave her access to uh, fMRI equipment. Took her several months to figure out how to run. <laughs> Can you imagine? Run the computer, start doing your own fMRI research, and she did. Uh, and uh, she looked at healers and he leads at a distance and showed this uh, coming into synchrony of the, uh, of the MRI, much like the EEG. So I, I was fortunate to have an opportunity to work directly with G, not on this work, but some other things. There's a picture from the Red Book. Uh, in, in, in the dragon in the center uh, sort of represents the deepest part of the unconscious itself in Jung's terms, the archetype of the self. He's not talking about the social self or the personal self, but this deep sense of what our purpose and destiny is. It's a, it's a center of power in the, in the personality. If you can get aligned with it, then you can follow your destiny. Or if you follow your destiny, then you can get aligned with it. That's a better way to put it. Uh, Jung uh, often said that uh, Frederick Nietzsche's insanity came from getting too close to the archetype of the self. You don't get too close to him. Uh, he won a, uh, James Hillman, the post Union, who passed away recently, said, Archetype, you want to get your life a hot stove. You want to get up close and get the heat a little bit, but don't grab on to him. You get yourself burned. And, uh, so that's an interesting theory about, uh, about Nietzsche. But the, uh, the, the center of the personality, the self, the archetype of the self is what radiates. And as we grow older and individuate, we become more and more in line with the self uh, and following its, uh, its goals and aspirations. Oh, there are the fish. I knew we had fish. Uh, well, just to drop back to a lighter uh, theme here for a minute, uh, lots of fish, lots of license plates. And uh, the point being that if you go around looking at numbers, you'll see a lot of numbers and a lot of things that uh, kind of hang together in a synchronistic way. I want to warn you, though, that synchronicity is uh, operate. Oh, and telephone synchronicity. I don't know if you have as much of that nowadays as cell phones. I mean, it used to be with the old phones. You know, a lot of synchronicity. You go to the phone to call up an old friend, the damn phone would ring. Or how often would you pick up the receiver and it would already be on there? Uh, you know, Electronics don't work quite that well, but you know, the telephone synchronicity this is my favorite. Uh, although we don't get the libraries that much anymore, but uh, there, there, there were so many synchronicities that would go on libraries and bookstores that uh, uh, Arthur Kessler developed a turning club with the, the library angel. You know the library and you stumble around, the book falls out, and you go, damn, that's just what I was looking for. When my book on synchronicity came out years ago, uh, it sold like hotcakes in the little town I lived in, Asheville, North Carolina. So many uh, that they got piles of them up on the top shelf so they could sell them. You know? And uh, a friend of mine was talking to uh, uh, another Asheville person, 
And this other person, who I didn't know, told this friend of mine, said, I have to give a talk at the church tomorrow, probably Unitarian, and you know, I'm not sure what, and we thought of it as my friend said, we well, should read this book by Alan Cohen about synchronicity. And this lady said, well, I can see the books I read when it falls in my head. So, <clears throat> later that day, she was in the bookstore. You see this coming? And she was poking around, and something, she put a something coming down on her head, and she grabbed it. It was a book, fell on her head. So, that's <laughs> secret is on the book. Isn't it? <laughs> uh, library names on the subject. Uh, all suggesting more subtle realm that we uh, swim in, the sea of uh, meaning, uh, holographic. Uh, I hate to say the word turbulence, but I'll use that in a, in a nice sense of currents. Uh, and these themes have come up again and again. Uh, you know, synchronicity actually is often associated with various trickster figures. This is Anansi. Uh, Anansi, the African spider, is always causing trouble. Synchronicity. And uh, that one on the lower left has got my name on it. Alan Jones, Anansi, it was from Radio and uh, This is the Monkey King of China, often associated with miraculous events. Uh, so we're in the mythic realm here, sort of magical mythic realm, but what I want to emphasize is that this is part of the many layers of consciousness and experience which seem to tap into many layers of reality. Uh, so while at the deepest layer we may have a quantum vacuum, uh, there's a lot of stuff going on between here and there. Our Hermes, the trickster, the, he was a uh, uh, Psychopomp will leave souls to the, uh, to the netherworld, uh, but he did a lot more than that. And he was the friendliest god to human beings and brought many good, uh, good coincidences our way. There he is. Uh, and in the U.S., uh, we have uh, Brer Rabbit and uh, a number of other characters that were always playing tricks on people. They're, they're also tricksters. In the whole realm of Brer Rabbit stories here, he, he goes to the, gets in an argument with this baby that's made out of tar. He gets in a fight with it, and then he gets stuck in the tar. Or uh, the star of tar movie. But Native Americans often refer to Coyote as a trickster. And there's Mr. Coyote hopping around, creating trouble for people, but often also good good things, and if you go to Mesoamerica, it is Latin America, and points south, Coyote becomes a kind of god, an archetype. Uh, very much like Hermes, but a little more wild, and brings good luck, uh, and also plays tricks on people. So, if you look at the Mayan and Aztec uh, imagery, you often see uh, Coyote represented in these. And it was a major god, actually. Um, he's very playing electric guitar, I'm not sure whether that was part of the online culture or not. <laughs> I put that up because that, that's a really nice picture. And so is that one. So, thank you very much. That's my little presentation.